Today, we start a new series on the Beatitudes. You know, I have never preached a sermon series on this remarkable passage of scripture. I have been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, the Beatitudes. Now, to tee this up, I want to just make an observation. It really is remarkable how different people want different things. Human beings, in spite of all that we have in common, all that makes us the same, there are so many ways that we are different. It really is astounding how different human beings can be. If you've ever had to share the remote control at your house with somebody, <laughs> you know what this is. <laughs> Trying to figure, okay, what do you want to watch? Well, I don't care until you choose something, then all of a sudden they care. You know, that, you know how that works. So, you know, my, my, wife, my wife likes um, baking shows on television where they bake. <laughs> You know, there's no, there's really no plot. There's no character development. They just spend the show baking stuff. You know, I have tried really, really hard to gain an appreciation for that kind of television. It just doesn't strike me as interesting. Uh, people are different. When you go to a restaurant, someone will hand you a menu and almost always there's more than one item on the menu. Do you know why? Because different people like different things. If you go to a shopping mall, there's more than one kind of store selling clothing there. You know why? People like different things. It is really remarkable how human beings can be so different in their preferences. However, there is something that unites us all. No matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what your background looks like, no matter your socioeconomic status or your level of education, there is something that we all share as a common preference. We all want to be happy. Happiness. In spite of all of our differences, happiness is a universal pursuit. People all over our world every single day do all that they can to pursue after happiness. In fact, people all over our world every single day will sacrifice much to have it. Happiness is one of those things that we all want. So it shouldn't be too surprising to us that Jesus had a lot to say about it. Jesus had a lot to say about how to be truly happy. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be in the fifth chapter of Matthew's gospel for the coming weeks. Now, those of you familiar with the New Testament, know that Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 record one of Jesus' most famous sermons that he preached while he was here on earth. We refer to it as the Sermon on the Mount. Why do we call it the Sermon on the Mount? Because it was a sermon Jesus delivered on a mountain, a small hill in Galilee. Now, in the coming weeks, we are going to examine the introduction to that Sermon on the Mount. The introduction to that sermon is commonly referred to as the Beatitudes, and we're gonna see why in just a few moments. The Beatitudes. Uh, and in the coming weeks, we are going to walk down through everything Jesus said in the Beatitudes. But this morning, I just wanna make some general observations to prepare us for the coming weeks, okay? And I want to begin by sharing with you the context in which the Sermon on the Mount was given. Listen, if you ever want to understand a passage of Scripture fully and accurately, you have to understand something about the context in which it was given. Well, let me share with you the context of the Sermon on the Mount. 
Uh, when Jesus began his public ministry, he was about 30 years old, and he was living in a place called Nazareth. Nazareth had been his home for 30 years or so. Uh, that's where he grew up. That's where he most likely worked in his father's carpenter's shop. Nazareth was his home. Well, when he began his public ministry and began to make claims that he was, in fact, the Messiah, the people who grew up with Jesus, the people who had known Jesus all of his life, rejected those claims. Jesus, we know who you are. You are not the Messiah. And they rejected his message. Jesus does not stay where he is rejected. So you know what Jesus did? Jesus left his hometown. He left Nazareth, moved out. And when he did, he moved about 30 miles to the northeast uh, in Galilee to the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee to a place called Capernaum. Capernaum happens to be the place where Peter, one of his disciples, lived with his mother-in-law. And it was there that Jesus, Jesus centered his ministry. His ministry headquarters became Capernaum. Okay, when Jesus moved to Capernaum and continued his public ministry there, Matthew chapter 4 verse 23 tells us that Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering with severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed, and he healed them. Now watch verse 25. Large crowds from Galilee... The Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. So after leaving his hometown, hometown of Nazareth, and after preaching in all of these different locations, and after healing people throughout the region, Jesus' popularity begins to grow. An increasing number of people from all over become curious about and intrigued by this man named Jesus. Here is a man who teaches with great authority. Here's a man that can heal people of their sickness. And crowds began to follow after him. And that's when Matthew chapter 5 opens up. Matthew chapter 5 begins with these two verses. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds that were intrigued and interested in him, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Did you notice that? When Jesus saw the crowds, he called his disciples to him. There is a distinction between all of those who were curious about Jesus, who were intrigued by him, and those who were his disciples, those who were committed to his teaching and committed to following after him. Now, just to be clear, the disciples that came to him, who were, who listened, who was the, who was the, were the audience for the Sermon on the Mount, this was not just his, the 12 disciples he would call. How do we know that? Because after Jesus preaches his sermon in Matthew chapter 7, Matthew tells us when Jesus, uh, when Jesus had finished these sayings, his sermon, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. So there was a crowd of disciples. But what I want you to understand is that crowd of disciples to whom Jesus spoke on the Sermon on the Mount was distinct and different from the crowds that were intrigued by him in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. So what, what I'm getting across here is there is a big difference between being interested in Jesus, 
being intrigued by Jesus and following him. The sermon that Jesus gives us in Matthew's five, Matthew chapters five, six, and seven are directed toward those who were his disciples. They had more than just interest. They had more than just intrigue. They were committed to what Jesus was saying. So having said that, I would like to read down through the entire portion of scripture that we call the Beatitudes. This is the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, and it begins in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Would you please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's holy word from Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. The words of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You may be seated. These verses that Jesus gives us make up the Beatitudes. Now, I just want to make an observation right off the bat. At first reading, these, these sentences that Jesus spoke sound like a series of counterintuitive claims, don't they? Jesus seems to pair things together that don't seem to belong together. For example, he says, blessed are those who mourn. Well, that doesn't seem, in our, in our way of thinking, that doesn't seem to go together. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those don't seem to go together upon first reading. Okay, immediately, right out of the gate, Jesus shocks his followers by making these series of counterintuitive claims. And here's the key to understanding what Jesus is saying here. There is a difference between this world's kingdom and God's kingdom. The first observation that I want to share with you about the Beatitudes today is that the Beatitudes describe citizenship in God's kingdom, not this world's kingdom, okay? The rules that apply in this world's kingdom are different from the rules that apply in God's kingdom. I'll give you an example. Uh, we just got back from the Holy Land, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, our first night in the Holy Land reminded me of my very first trip there. On our very first trip a number of years ago, Catherine and I had uh, packed as best we could, as best we knew how, and one of the things we had packed was a hair dryer, an American hair dryer, okay? So, you know, we thought all we needed was a little plug-in that lets you plug it into the different receptacles that are over there. So on that first trip, first night, we took a shower, washed our hair, I plugged that hair dryer in, turned it on, and within a matter of seconds, it burned up. Now, do you know why? Because a Hair dryers that work in the American kingdom does, do not necessarily work in Israel's kingdom. Different set of rules applies, different set of conditions apply. Okay, there is a difference between this world's kingdom and God's kingdom. You see, we are really citizens of God's kingdom. We live here, 
in this kingdom, but we're citizens of God's kingdom. And the rules, the conditions that apply in God's kingdom are different from the conditions that apply in this earthly kingdom. In this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is referring to kingdom citizenship, the rules, the conditions that are true in God's kingdom, not necessarily this earthly kingdom. Okay, now, here's another observation that I want to make sure we're together on before we begin this series. The Beatitudes, this series of statements that Jesus made, describe blessedness in the present. Okay, over and over again, Jesus says, blessed are, that word is important, not blessed will be, blessed are. In the here and now, you can be blessed. You can be blessed. Now, what did Jesus mean when he said you can be blessed? Okay, that word literally translate is translated from the Greek word makarios, makarios. And makarios literally means happy, happy. Jesus is saying you can be truly happy in the here and now. Right now, you can be happy. In fact, if you translate that word into the Latin, into Latin, the Latin word is beatitudo, is, which is the word we get beatitudes from. Why do we call these the beatitudes? Because the Latin word for happy is beatitudo. They're the beatitudes. Jesus is telling us that we as disciples of his, as followers of Jesus, can be happy in the here and now. Now, let me clarify what Jesus meant by happiness. It didn't mean just feeling good all the time, no. What did Jesus mean by happiness? First, a couple things. First, this happiness that Jesus spoke of is obviously resilient to circumstances. Jesus says, you can be happy if you're mournful. Well, that's obviously a happiness that is separated from what's going on around you. Now, if you think about it logically, that makes sense. Because any happiness that is dependent on your circumstances cannot be true happiness. Now, why would I say that? Because if your happiness depends on your circumstances, at some level, you are concerned, you are afraid about what might happen if your circumstances change to steal away your happiness. A couple of examples. If your happiness is dependent upon having a good job, at some level, you are concerned and afraid about losing the source of your happiness. Uh, if your happiness is based on what's happening in the stock market, you're not very happy right now. Uh, at some level, you're going to be concerned and fearful about something that might happen outside of your control that would steal away your happiness. When happiness is dependent on your circumstances, it's not real happiness. The happiness Jesus is talking about has nothing to do with what's going on around you. It is resilient. It is independent from, it is separate from our circumstances. One other uh, observation about this happiness that Jesus is talking about. This happiness points to the future. Now, don't let's not. It's happiness we experience in the present, but it is a happiness that points to the future over and over again. Jesus said, Blessed are for they will. Did you notice that? Blessed are in the here and now, 
because they will in the future experience something. So this blessedness, this happiness that Jesus spoke of is experienced in the present, but it points to the future. Okay, Christians, without any doubt, I know that there are many here this morning and you're going through a hard time. Life has brought you a great challenge. Perhaps you're heartbroken over a relationship. Perhaps you're grieving the loss of someone close to you. Perhaps you're facing a challenge and you do not know how you're going to handle it. Life has a way of taking us to those places. Okay, Christian, listen to me. No matter where you are right now, your future glory outweighs it all. Paul said, you know, I, when I think about all of my trials, all my struggles, uh, and Paul had a lot of them. Paul had been stoned. Paul had been rejected. Paul had been beaten. Paul says, you know, in light of all of my troubles that I experience on earth, they don't even compare to the glory that awaits me. There's a saying that says, all's well that ends well. For a believer, there's a lot of truth in that. No matter where we find ourselves in this life, our future glory gives us hope. The happiness that we can enjoy as Jesus' disciples on earth points toward a glorious future. One final observation that I would like to make about this happiness that Jesus spoke of, these beatitudes. The beatitudes are beatitudes, not do attitudes. Now, I know that's a silly way to say it. What am I trying to get across? The happiness that Jesus spoke of, that we can experience in the present, is not gained by doing something. It is gained by being something. There is a... This list, of, this list of commands or this, these, this series of sentences spoken by our Lord, these are not, for, if you do this, 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 and this, then you'll be happy. That is not what this is. If you, the reason we know that's not what it is because later in chapter five, Jesus says this, uh, be perfect, therefore, as the heavenly father is perfect. So if, if Jesus was saying, here's what you need to do to be happy, he would be saying, all you got to do, if you want to be happy, all you got to do is be perfect. Simple as that. No, that's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is not linking happiness to what we can achieve or earn on our own. Jesus is linking happiness to who we are. Uh, here's, a, here's an example. It's an old example. You've probably seen it before. This light bulb. This light bulb has every, every ability to give off light. In fact, this light bulb was designed and manufactured for one purpose, to give off light. But this light bulb will never do, will never experience what it was designed and created for on its own. There's no amount of effort that this light bulb can go to to give off light. There is no amount of good intention that can cause this light bulb to give off light. There's no amount of desire that can cause this light bulb to give off light. There's nothing this light bulb can do to do what it was created to do. The only way this light bulb can do what it was created for, is to be placed in a power source like a lamp. If this light bulb is in a lamp that can provide it the power it needs, all of the sudden the light bulb can do what before it could not do. Now notice this, has the light bulb done anything different? 
No. The only thing that changed was what it was in. Jesus spoke directly to this in the New Testament. He didn't use a light bulb as an example. The world wasn't quite ready for that. Uh, here's what Jesus, Jesus used a picture of fruit and a vine. Let me read this. John chapter 15. I am the true vine, Jesus said. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he, he prunes so that it will bear even more fruit. If you're, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Who's the vine? Jesus. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in Jesus. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Kingdom citizenship and the happiness that Jesus is talking about has nothing to do with what we do. It has everything to do with who we are as followers of Jesus, as we are in Christ. That is the source of true happiness. Kingdom living, folks, is only possible in Christ. When Jesus says you can enjoy happiness in the present, that only comes when we are in Christ. As we come to the close of this part of our service, I wonder if there might be those here and you're tired of searching for happiness because you've tried it all. You've looked around every corner. You've looked under every rock. You've done all that you can do. You even made great sacrifice to pursue after those things that you think will make you happy. And one by one, they have failed. The source of true happiness is found only in Jesus. Only until we yield our lives to him, accepting what he did for us to make everything right between us and our creator, only then, only then, will we, will we be able to experience the happiness of which Jesus spoke. I would like for everyone in the room to bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a moment. Can I ask you a question? Are you in Christ? Do you experience that happiness that comes from belonging to him? I would like to invite everyone in the room to pray along with me a prayer whereby you can receive Jesus as your savior. You can be in him, accepted into his family, grafted into the body of Christ. Your prayer might sound something like this. God, I recognize I'm a sinner. And I come before you right now confessing my belief that Jesus was your son. He died in my place to pay the penalty for my sin. And then he rose from the dead. And I'm confessing also that I'm placing all my hope, all my trust in what Jesus did for me to rescue me from my sin so that I can become part of your family. In Jesus' name, amen. If that was your heartfelt prayer, I'd like to invite you to do something. In a few moments after we observe the Lord's Supper, we're going to dismiss from our service. As you leave, over in the lobby is a place called Guest Services. If you prayed along with me just now, we have literature there for you. There's no charge for it. It's our gift to you because it's literature that explains what it means to place your faith in Jesus. So if you prayed along with me or if you're curious, you'd like to know more about Christianity, please go by and receive it from us. If you're watching online, and you prayed along with me just now or would like to know more information, 
Uh, you can uh, also have the same literature if you'll simply go to the website, imadeadecision.com. It's imadeadecision.com. There's a place where you can provide us your mailing address. Send that to us and we'll put that literature in the mail to your home this coming week. Thank you for watching this video on First Redeemer's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it, click like below and leave us a comment. And if you'd like more content like this, click subscribe and turn on your notifications. Thanks again for watching.